Greetings. In a few minutes, you're going to hear a wonderful teaching on the life and ministry of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. It's called Welsh Night. And the theme of this particular uh, session was uh, on the doctor. Uh, you'll see Reverend Jeff Thomas um, doing the teaching. Uh, there's also a video, a family video, narrated by uh, the doctor's grandson, Jonathan Catherwood, as well as an, uh, an introduction. Um, and you'll hear those that gather that evening um, sing a hymn. You can see the original video by going to the community tab. Um, I would encourage you to subscribe because it sounds to me there'll be more Welsh nights and I think it'll be edifying for the soul. Now, a couple things I want to just mention to you I thought you might be interested in. Reverend Jeff Thomas and the doctor knew each other very well. In fact, I know that you know at least one time, if not many times, Reverend Jeff Thomas was with the doctor um, during Christmas time with the family. Um, and I got the chance to meet Reverend Jeff Thomas at a banners conference. I knew that they knew each other, and I went to this banner conference up in Elizabethtown, Pennsylvania, for the sole purpose of talking with Reverend Jeff Thomas. I went there with a friend. It was um, absolutely amazing. Reverend Jeff Thomas, I think, was supposed to preach maybe like two times, but he ended up preaching four times. In the very first sermon, I think it's called The State of Man. Again, you can find it uh, on the community tab. I, I believe I have it there, The State of Man. And when he was done preaching, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, you couldn't hear a pin drop. We were humbled. We were in awe. I mean, God really spoke through the man. Now, a lot of times I think, right or wrongly, I like a lot of times like people um, will kind of like focus or gravitate towards pastors that have a more well-known name. Are younger, you know, those pastors that might be in their late 30s or 40s or 50s. And Reverend Jeff Thomas, probably going to be the eldest preacher there that was on the stage. And and so I thought, you know, I have a chance to talk to this man because I think, you know, he's going to be overlooked. But of course, after he preached that first sermon, yeah, he wasn't overlooked. Everybody wanted to talk to him. But he was gracious enough to give me 30 minutes. And it was interesting as we were talking, um, there's a pastor listening from a distance and this pastor jumped over pews like four of them to sit behind us. And he said, I don't want to interrupt. I just want to listen in. So I had in my mind, I formulated what I want to talk to, to the pastor about. How does he keep his heart warm for the Lord? How does he grow in his faith? Um, how does he keep his own soul strengthened and rich? And so we spoke about that um, in his honesty, because he said, you know, all of us, there's all these things trying to compete for our affections and that we must be on guard and that he admitted his own heart grows cold for the Lord, but then the Lord graciously meets him again in his word and draws him back. And so it was just refreshing to hear a pastor say, yeah, it is a challenge, isn't it? And the way he stays close to the Lord, obviously, is listening to the Lord through the word, of, through his word. Um. But, but there are times where he becomes stale and dull and dry, as he was describing it. He agreed that Robert Murray McShane, very helpful, very helpful, and it was the best reading guide, where you read the Old Testament once a year and New Testament and Psalms twice a year. Uh, he talked about the necessity of just, like you, it's, it's like breathing, like the necessity for our prayer life, um, and that it should be, organic it should be real it shouldn't be formal he spoke about that we talked about um the welsh calvinistic methodist and of course i wanted to get his thoughts about daniel Rowland. and the way i did is i said you know many would argue that dr martin lloyd jones is the greatest preacher of the 20th century and he goes oh yes that's right and i said in 19th century it would be the baptist charles spurgeon and reverend thomas goes yes that's right and the next one I knew he wouldn't agree with, but I was trying to make a point. I said, but in the 18th century, they would say Reverend George Whitfield. Now, I wouldn't say that it was a frown, but it was disapproval. He was eagerly wanting to correct me. And I said, but before he could correct me, I said, but if you ask Reverend George Whitfield, who's the greatest preacher, he would say it's the Welshman, Reverend Daniel Rowland. And Reverend Thomas, 
He laughed. I think he might have slapped my knee. He laughed. He, yeah, so he laughed so much. He goes, that's a good one. That's a good one there. So he knew I kind of like set it up. And then so we spoke about Reverend Daniel Roland and what Roland meant to him. And then we just talked about, uh, 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 so we talked about his own ministry. We talked about Reverend Daniel Roland and the Welsh Calvinistic Methodist. And then we talked about the ministry of Lloyd-Jones. Um, and so I just want to tell you, it was an absolute delight to have him end up preaching like three or four times, like I said, at the conference. Now, in terms of like his honesty, like when you listen to Reverend Jeff Thomas, you'll see, he's, oh, wow, he's a genuine Christian. He's, he's the real deal. And like notice at the end of his prayer, he asked for forgiveness for ever bothering the doctor, for causing him any grief. Um, isn't it nice to, to speak so plainly to God? And you, you can imagine that Reverend Jeff Thomas is probably speaking about himself um, as far as causing the doctor any trouble or debating whatever it might have been. But I just find that just so refreshing and honest. Now, it's also, um, there's also a warning. Charing Cross, which is a Welsh Calvinistic Methodist church in London, um, it was almost like a cathedral type church, very large building. It hasn't been a church in a very long time. And Reverend Jeff Thomas points out that he goes, you know, becoming a member of that church, as the doctor was when he was a boy, where he met his future wife, Beth Ann, by the way, um, stopped being a church. Instead, it was an employment center. It's where you went to go meet people and get a job, it was a music center. It was a social place, a place to talk about politics. It was many things, and the Bible was open up, and Jesus' name was used, and um, uh, they sung hymns and things of that nature, but it, it just wasn't grounded. They, they lost their way. So, so there is a way to assemble together as a group of people, to use Christ's name, to have his book used, to sing hymns. Um, but it's so formal, uh, and the the heart isn't right. It's, it's not coming together to glorify God. People's hearts are far from them. Um, so, because <laughs> there was just this assumption, I think the doctor would just talk about even like the questions that he was asked to become a member of this church, how superficial they were. You know, there weren't there weren't questions like this when George Whitfield meet Hal Harris. Do you know that your sins have been forgiven? Have you felt the conviction of sin? What was your response to it? What have you been doing since then? Tell me about your love for the Lord Jesus Christ. What work has he done in your heart, in your life? What challenges do you see? Um, you know, what effect has the word of God on your soul? You know, basically kind of get to the question of like, do you have new affections for the Lord? If the Lord has done a work within your heart. You know, I think it was Lloyd Jones who said, you know, we know when somebody is born again, when their heart is regenerate, they stay regenerate. Why? Because it's a work of God that God has done this wonderful work. So the church was very superficial, in so but it's a way, um, just as a way to point out. And I want to emphasize this one truth, and then I'll be done. Is success, if you will, is reaching God's kingdom, and we do that by being in Christ. Anything short of that is called failure. Spending eternity in hell is failure. So there's a lot of ways to become nice and respectable and gifted and talented. But friends, if we die in our sins, we've accomplished nothing. So I really want to state this to pastors, to elders, to deacons. You know, to ourselves, 
to our families. Let's be clear that what we want to do, the, the aim, is to be with Christ for all of eternity. And anything short of that is failure. And I just want to put it as plainly as possible. So like when Pastor Jeff Thomas talked about, there's a lot of things that compete for our affections that can draw us away from Christ. There's a lot of ways that can lead us into a superficial Christian life and just stay there and remain there. And that must not happen. That can't happen. I want you to think hard about that. Don't allow yourself, don't allow your congregation, don't allow your family, don't allow your neighbors, anyone to stay respectable but dead in their sins. Let us not do that. And Pastor Jeff Thomas ends the talk by a wonderful prayer where he asks the Lord to move again, you know, rend the heavens and come down and move again, that that. It, that there would be better days for the church. That's how he puts it. There, there would be better days for the church. But then he says, but until then, Lord, stay with us. Keep us. Stay with us. And I just think that's so sweet. Well, until next week, I'm going to end it there. A grace upon grace be with you all. Warm welcome to our Welsh night. Uh, it's lovely to uh, to be here and uh, see familiar faces and familiar uh, people. And uh, it's especially uh, good to welcome Jeff. Uh, it's, it's a good night for me. When I was first converted, uh, I read books by Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, and he is our theme tonight. I think I read uh, the sermon, studies in the Sermon on the Mount um, first, and then spiritual depression. And then not long after, I went to university in Aberystwyth and uh, got to listen to Jeff Thomas uh, for three years. So two important things for me being brought together uh, this evening. So it's, uh, it's lovely to be here. Um, I'll just read a few verses from Psalm 85, then I'll pray and then we'll sing. And then we're going to watch a little clip uh, from the life of uh, uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, his family life, and then it's over, over to Jeff. So Psalm 85... I'll just read the first seven verses. You showed favour to your land, O Lord. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people and covered all their sins. You set aside all your wrath and turned from your fierce anger. Restore us again, O God, our Saviour, and put away your displeasure towards us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger through all generations? Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your unfailing love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. We'll pray. Father God, we ask that you would uh, be with us as we uh, come to this meeting tonight. We thank you for what you have done in the past. Uh, we pray as we hear 
uh, about the influence of uh, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, we would have a desire in our own hearts uh, to know and to see your unfailing love again. Uh, that uh, seeing that love and knowing more of that love ourselves, we might love you in return and give every part of who we are to your service. Uh, be with us and we ask. We um, pray that everything done would be done for your glory this night. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we'll stand to sing. Uh, 550. 550. Jesus, lover of my soul, let me to thy bosom fly. While the nearer waters roll, while the tempest still is high. We'll stand and sing 550. Jonathan Catherwood uh, of the MLJ Trust. 
The MLJ Trust is a charity in the United States that preserves the 1600 audio sermons of the late Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. Dr. Lloyd-Jones and his wife, Bethan Lloyd-Jones, had two daughters, Elizabeth, my mother, and Anne, my beloved aunt, and each of them had three children. So Elizabeth had Christopher, Beth and Jane, and myself, and my aunt Anne had Elizabeth, Beth and Jane, and alas, my cousins were born in the late 1960s, but were and the late night interest in seeing what he was like outside of the pulpit. As a grandfather, he was very warm and loving and gentle, and these are the videos where we see him smiling and relaxed. And for many people who watch this video, they will have been at Westminster Chapel at some point during his 30 years there. I'll try and keep the voiceovers to a minimum, but just to point out uh, who is who, and we hope you enjoy it. This was a family gathering for what we think was my great grandmother's 92nd birthday in the early 60s. My grandmother, Beth and Lloyd Jones, is in the middle, and coming into the frame on the right is my mother, Elizabeth, and my sister, Beth and Jane. There's our birthday girl. She lived to be 93 years old. Here is the family. You see my grandfather, Martin Lloyd Jones, on the steps. That's my lovely Aunt Anne uh, and my mother, uh, the two sisters together. Here's a day out. My grandfather was never without a tie, and never without a hat, uh, no matter what the weather is. That's Beth and my mother. And here is Bethan sitting on my grandfather's knee. Uh, he was a very sweet and gentle grandfather, and we were always on and off his knees, as were my cousins in the early 70s. That's me being annoying. Apparently I was ill that day, and that's my excuse. And my grandmother was always in the house, and uh, with my cousins, as well as my brother and my sister. Uh, you just couldn't get a sweetie grandmother. older now that was my brother running uh, into the frame that's my sister um, that is me as a little boy trying to let go of my grandfather's hand to run towards the camera they took us on a lot of outings uh, when we spend time together in the Easter and over the summer holidays and that is the smile that I remember he was always with a book two to three hours every afternoon uh, reading books in the library. And he also encouraged us to read and was interested in reading what we were reading, uh, no matter how rubbish it was. He liked to know what we were doing, what we were reading, and uh, to take an interest in it. to see my grandmother without a hat, not just on church on Sunday. You will notice coming up in this shot that even though my grandfather liked to lead in the pulpit, when it came to walking around the gardens, my grandmother had quite a lot to say. Uh, she was a terrific woman. She's one of the earliest of her generation to become a medical doctor in the 1920s. She had 27 proposals of marriage, and my grandfather was the first one, and he was the last one. Uh, he just kept going, as he had been turned there by my grandmother. But he fell in love almost immediately and just hung in and hung in until she finally said yes.
In the background, you can see my grandfather playing mini golf with my brother and my sister and myself. He was a great fan of sports and would take us out in the afternoon and play this game and croquet where he was easily the best in the family. We do hope that you've enjoyed these home movies and thank you for watching them. It's a great uh, joy to be here tonight and uh, see you all of you back to Dulles. In the 1940s, I'd come on Sunday evenings with uh, my father to Bethania, and uh, he was the treasurer in Bethania and uh, sing the Welsh hymns there. And uh, I remember one night in 41, standing on the steps um, outside Bethania, all the congregation we gathered and looked down the valley. 25 miles away to Cardiff, and the sky was red with flames. Cardiff had been the recipient of um, incendiary bombs. It was an awful, solemn silence and sadness, and we were at, at war. Lord Jones was born in uh, 1899, um, at the time when modernism was so enormously attractive and came in, started in Europe, and came across and uh, hit uh, Britain and Wales with its uh, inferiority complex, not wanting to be considered uh, a lot of uh, ignorant fundamentalists, uh, just swallowed it all, and especially from the universities, from uh, Bangor and Aber and Swansea and Cardiff, and, but there was a great uh, difference um, from Bangor and from Aberystwyth. There really was no resistance to it at all. And the Congregational College and the uh, Baptist College in Bangor and the Presbyterian College could send out um, men who denied the supernatural, who denied the historic fall, who didn't believe in the truthfulness of, of the Word of God. Um, they just went out uh, into that area and uh, one of the uh, liberal professors in Aberystwyth would say um, there are no fundamentalists in, in North Wales. But things are different in South Wales. Uh, and the universities and uh, liberalism didn't have the same impact um, from Cardiff or from Swansea. There was the forward movement. There was a forward movement um, near more or less in, in Aber, but Cardiff had Heath and it had Memorial Hall and uh, um, Neath and there were conservative strongholds and there were Baptist, many Baptist chapels like, like this one. Um, and there were men of God like R.B. Jones who was born here in Dallas and uh, they were Bible believing and Bible gospel, gospel uh, preaching men and there were um, brethren assemblies and there were um, Pentecostal churches and so South Wales then, the Bible Belt from um, Newport right across to Carmarthen, that, that's where evangelicalism was uh, Evangelical Christianity was maintained and strengthened in Wales. And then um, in 1904, there was a, a, a great movement of the Spirit of God. And um, there were this church, a um, hundred members joined it in 1905. So you can see the impact that little churches everywhere and gospel pulpits, God honoured them and uh, and and bless them greatly. Um, three movements came out of the 1904 revival. The, the first was the Pentecostal movement, the Apostolic Church, under the great uh, Pastor Dan, uh, who was a, just a holy man and a earnest and a fervent uh, preacher. And uh, they scattered then through, especially the Carmarthenshire area, um, apostolic churches, and then they went to the continent and to uh, Africa. Peter Gross was there, 
headquarters. So that was one movement that came out of the 1904 revival. And the second movement then was the mission halls. There were um, people who um, were converted and they earnestly spoke to their fellow church members uh, about entering into the blessing. That was the phrase that was used at the time. And um, uh, people were um, offended by them and there was splits and many uh, evangelicals left. And so there was a network of gospel halls that were that were started, tinans, as we used to call them. And um, they were um, spread across, especially Cardiff and, and Swansea, but uh, Merthyr had them as well. Um, and uh, that was uh, the second movement that, that came out of the, um, the 1904 revival. And then the third movement that came out were called Planted You Again, the children um, of the revival. And that is uh, the people who uh, were given great assurance and strength and conviction and loved the gospel. And many were saved. They say 100,000 were, were saved at that time. And uh, so a great impact was made through them. And these are the people then that were in the churches, very respectful, not discerning, not theologically minded, because the 1904 revival wasn't a, um, a theologically uh, astute uh, exegetical kind of preaching. Um, it, it wasn't that, but there were many, many people who came to trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And they became the elders in the church. They became the Sunday school teachers. They're the ones who prayed in 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 the in the prayer meetings. They're the ones who showed interest in in mission and evangelism. And when um, uh, people like Lord Jones came and in the midweek meetings, he came and. Uh, and preached in uh, in Merthyr and Neath and uh, Cardiff and Swansea and Mid Wales and North Wales. Oh, they loved to hear the gospel and responded to it. And uh, they kept then um, the gospel and the gospel influences in, in the major denominations, very respectful towards their ministers, but uh, not, not, very, not very discerning at all then God does something new. And God always does something new. And oh, I want you to remember that. And God worked again in Wales. But he didn't work through the Pentecostal church. He didn't work through um, the, um, the mission halls. And he didn't work through then... Um, the children of the revival. Lord Jones's family were none of those. And uh, Lord Jones's father named Henry, he wasn't interested really in Christianity. He went because everyone went to church in those days and, and he went. Um, but oh, he was interested in politics. He was interested in Lord George and the liberal movement and uh, that's what they buzzed and spoke about so much. He was a grocer in Cardiff, and that's where uh, the, the doctor was, uh, was born. And um, in 1899, and uh, to a Cardiff grocer, they stayed there about five years. And then um, his father and mother decided they would go back. They were Cardiffanshire people. They would go back to Llangaitho, the home of uh, the base of Daniel Rowland, the, great, the greatest of the... 18th century Welsh reformers and uh, Calvinistic Methodists, they, they went there. And uh, um, it, there was no gospel preaching in the local church. Um, and um, one thing greatly happened, it was the 200th anniversary of the birth of da da Daniel Rowland. And so the Calvinist Methodist Church in Wales had celebrations for a week centred in Llangaitho, and there were lectures and talks in the night about um, Daniel Rowland, Howell Harris, and Panta Kellyn, and uh, this 13-year-old uh, boy listening eagerly and uh, opening up um, to him the, the mighty works of God, experiential religion. He was a, a very conservative man, um, anyway, morally speaking, he was 
dreadfully conservative. He grumbles in his early talks about women playing tennis and about this new fad for a radio and indoor toilets, that sort of thing. It was all new and uh, he was very conservative in his attitude. But um, he, he had um, a conscience and he had a fine mind. And um, he was wonderfully delivered from a fire in the house. Um, the shop in Flandreifo that they uh, took over um, was the centre in the village. And uh, the people would gather there in the day and they would talk and everyone smoked in those days. And there was a cigarette that was thrown into a bin which just smouldered and smouldered. And when the family went to bed, the thing exploded and the fire just destroyed the house. And um, Lloyd Jones was let down to neighbours who put their hands up uh, and caught the boy uh, with his older and his younger brother um, at that time. He was a brand plucked from the burning, very much like John Wesley was uh, when he was delivered from such a fire too. But uh, they never recovered from that fire and um, they, his father was bankrupt and he thought it was time for him to move, to go to Canada. And uh, so he went to explore, he sailed across the Atlantic and um, he, he tried to see how he and his family would settle there, but he was an old man, he felt, and it was too late for him to change. And so he came home and they got a business uh, selling milk in, in London. And so they all moved to London, they moved to the Charing Cross uh, area, and uh, there they became members of Charing Cross Chapel. There were a thousand members in the church. It was, a, the, the, one of, it was the strongest of the 25 well-speaking chapels. There are about 10 still, and I preach in them in London these days. And uh, there were 25 then, and Jewin was a big chapel, and the Welsh Baptists where Lloyd George would occasionally attend. Um, and then um, there was Charing Cross as well. It was, it was an employment agency. It was a marriage bureau. It was a cultural centre. It was a music centre. Um, it was a place where you caught up with your friends and family and connections and in the Welsh language. And it, it had a, uh, some very able, very able preachers and uh, Lloyd Jones then showed his brilliance. He'd gone to Tregaron School and he came then to Westminster School and um, there, there he shone. He shone in the sciences, in mathematics and science. And uh, at 15, he went to Barts College to begin his career. The youngest uh, student in the place to begin uh, his studies. And on Sundays he was in church and uh, the um, in charge of the um, Sunday school for for men, um, uh, he Tom Phillips. He was um, Evan Phillips. Son Evan Phillips went through the nineteen four that went through the eighteen fifty nine revival, and then he went through the nineteen o four revival um, as well in Newcastle Emily, and uh, was instrumental in both of them learning a lot in the first and giving a lot in, in the um, 1859 revival. And the denomination made him the moderator and the denomination then um, awarded him recognition and they established a little school so that boys who had left school at 13 to become farmers or to become tin plate um, workers or miners and then were saved and were called to the ministry had a preparatory college to go to uh, before they went to Aberystwyth to the seminary there, the theological college. And uh, uh, one of his sons then, um, he led that college and another of the sons then was um, a, an ophthalmologist, uh, very highly regarded in London. And uh, he led the men's Bible classes and, and talked and discussed and argued with uh, Dr. Lloyd-Jones as he was finding his way uh, theologically and learning 
um, these things. And then um, Wilson's a chapel not far away um, called Dr. John Hutton, who was a fine evangelical preacher. And so often Lord Jones would go and listen and heard the gospel and may well have come to a saving understanding of the person and work of Christ by going to Westminster Chapel and uh, hearing uh, John Hutton, uh, Hutton preaching. And he became drawn to preaching more and more, more and more. And uh, he had fallen in love with, um, with Tom Phillips' daughter. You saw her there. She was very beautiful. Good. She, she, it was said she had 23 uh, requests for marriage. Um, but uh, the 24th was from Lord Jones, and she, she married him then. And um, she had little understanding of the gospel. So there was a weakness there in, in the church and in their understanding. That generation were losing, losing the... We are all ruined by the fall of God in sin. But God in his mercy and in love has sent his son, Jesus Christ, into the world to redeem us, to save us. He became the Lamb of God. And by our entrusting ourselves to this Savior, we are forgiven for our sins because of what Jesus has done. So when we meet God in the great day that lies before us, the great day of evaluation that comes after death, and God says to us, why, why should I let you into heaven? Then we will say, because of Jesus. That's all we'll say. We won't say because we were good and we were, because the best of us lived lives that were mixed with weakness and ego. But he didn't, he wasn't. A lamb without spot and without blemish, holy, harmless, undefied, separate from sinners. He lived the righteous life we've never lived and he died the atoning death that buys our forgiveness. That's the message of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that was the message that, that really Lloyd Jones was coming to understand through Dr. Hutton and through some aspects of it that his future father-in-law was, uh, was saying. And so um, this became more and more important to him. And so he, um, he said to his wife, you know, I'm thinking of becoming a preacher, but you've never preached. She said to him, yes, I have. I preach to myself, he said to her. Uh, and we do, and we still do. We preach us, we preach to, to ourselves. And uh, so it was no encouragement. Everyone was saying to him, look, um, what a future you've got. You can help people. You can help your family. And then Sundays you can preach if you want to. But look, look, you're now working with Lord Horton, the the king's physician. And look at the future for you. A lordship, house of lords, influence, money. Um, two friends of his invited him and Bethan to go to a, a drama in Leicester Square at the theatre there. And uh, he can't remember what he was. Everyone was saying how wonderful it was, and he, he enjoyed it in, in that measure. And he came out that evening after the four of them had watched this uh, drama together, and there was a Salvation Army band playing outside, and the Salvation Army were playing some of the hymns, like the one we sang tonight, and Blessed Assurance, and Jesus, Lover of My Soul. These are my people, he thought. These are my people. I'm going to stand with them. I'm going to identify with them. I'm going to live with gospel people. 
And so um, the leader of the forward movement that his minister sent him to talk to was really discouraging him and thinking, oh, what, what so much better he could do as a, as a doctor. But uh, he said, don't you believe in the sovereignty of God? He said it. So he gave him an invitation to preach in Sandfields in Port Talbot at the forward movement, at the forward as it's called. And uh, so he went there to preach and they were very struck by him. Very well. And, you know, the forward movement was losing its way. They had a drama society and the uh, uh, leading uh, man there, he... Uh, he was really believed in the social gospel and the brotherhood of, of man and the fatherhood of God. You know, I had my three uncles were Bethania, Douglas people. My father's twin brother, he went to Brecon. For years, he never preached on the Apostle Paul because he was told by those lecturers in Brecon that Paul had messed up the simple, basic Galilean gospel of Jesus, preaching on the brotherhood of man and the fatherhood of God. And Auntie Olive, Dad's sister, married Stanley, and uh, he also was a congregationalist minister. The only book he ever gave me from his library was by Fosdick, the American, who uh, really opposed Dr. J. Gresham Machen and... Uh, preached a famous sermon in New York, Shall the Fundamentalist Win? And then um, his brother, Albert, was rather sweet on my mother, my mother told me. And he was a minister in Port Albert at the same time as Dr. Roy Jones. Dr. Roy Jones liked him. He's a very likable man. I'm not saying that any of these people are, are not likable. But they'd lost their way. They'd lost. They'd lost the gospel of grace. They hadn't understood it. The, 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 the description God gives us of the depravity of man. God saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth and every imagination of the thoughts of our hearts, only evil continually. That's the state of man. Not that we're all only evil, but that all we do is taint it and corrupt it by it. So Roy Jones preached there and then he was asked back. And after the evening service of the second visit, then they interviewed him. And they asked him, um, would he be prepared to come there as minister? He told them he would. And they voted virtually unanimously. And he took the train back to London, the night sleeper back to London. He got to his uh, barts to the hospital on the Monday morning and there was a letter in his pigeonhole. He took it out and he said, the chief registrar wants to see you immediately. And so he went up and he knocked on the door and uh, he, he went in and there was the chief registrar and one of the top doctors there. And they had newspapers spread out all over the desks. And, and they said, these papers are reporting that you're going to be a preacher in Port Albert? So, oh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. There, there's been a leak to the press. And um, you were going to be the first to know this. I'm so sorry. Um, but is it true? Yes, it's true. I'm, I'm leaving London to become a preacher in Port Albert. And oh, they were outraged. And they pleaded with him and showed him again all the advantages so, of being a doctor and what he could do. And, and would he change his mind? And then they got irritable and, as he was stubborn. And he said to them, you know, after all you and I do to them, they are still going to die. You are still going to die in me. But God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And that's the message. It's the message that people of Wales need today. 
So, um, off he off he went, off he went to to Port Albert, and uh, he he did a Spurgeon. That is, he preached uh, on um, a verse of scripture in the morning and another verse in the evening, and uh, he did that for many years. He wasn't initially an expository, systematic, evangelistic preacher, but he was uh, a Spurgeonist Spurgeonist preacher there, like that, and. Um, I said to him, you had an enormous advantage, doctor, didn't you? Everybody knew you were a household name. You were in all the papers. Um, the publicity you had, you had given up all that in London too. He said, didn't help me at all. So they came out of curiosity to see me. They looked at me and then they weren't listening to what they were saying. And then they went away. That's all they did. They just looked at me. It took me six months for them to start to think about what I was saying to them. After, within the two years, his wife, Bethan, was converted under his ministry and then a, a great work of, uh, of, of grace began in the church. 70 new members, uh, two years later, three years later, 100 new members in a year. He had a brotherhood. There's a wonderful picture of it in Phil Eveson's uh, Travel Guide to Dr. Lloyd Jones, which is full of wonderful photographs. There are nowhere else many good photographs in Ian Murray's two biographies. And um, this brotherhood, well, it's bigger than all of us. There must be 60, 70 men all in their suits. And Lloyd Jones sitting there, the discussions they had, and the prayer meetings with 100, 200 people there. He tells the one prayer meeting in which 25 people prayed one after another. But Mrs. I.B. Davis, uh, I.B. was uh, saved through Brethren Evangelists in Devon, and he came back to Wales then and uh, joined uh, the Sandfields congregation. And Lord Jones taught him all about preaching, and all about what about what the gospel is and how how you how you you preach it. And she said to me, she said, "You know, there were some some prayer meetings, and we were slow in praying." And uh, the doctor would rebuke us for not praying. But we were so overwhelmed with a sense of God and his nearness and his greatness and our own inadequacies that we, we found it difficult, difficult to pray. So the same sort of tensions that we have in our prayer meetings when those silences that we don't want to come there and then in the midweek, he, he w went around and he, uh, he, he preached everywhere. Went by train, he had a chauffeur who took him and drove him to different places. And when, um, in 1958, I was in the Clamado camp. And I was, you know, almost 20 then, just finished in school. And I was, um, I hung around the leaders and the officers in camp and listened and overheard their conversation. They kept talking about the doctor. The doctor. I really was full of curiosity. Who is mine? There's Dr. Lord Jones. I'd never heard of him. And then I saw in the Western Mail that there was the induction service in uh, Memorial Hall in Cowboys Road of Dr. Ivan Evans on Wednesday night. So I took the train in from Bali, where we were living then. We'd gone from Hengoy to Bali. And um, I walked along and went in, and there was a full church. And the men in suits, the women with harps on. And we sang Wesley and Top Lady. And, and the doctor preached. 
And I told him later on, that was the first time I'd heard him. I, I couldn't remember. You, you remember, he said, I preached on uh, being ambassadors of Christ. This man was going to be a pharmacist. God laid his hand on him and, and changed him and uh, summoned him to be a, an ambassador, a proclaimer of the kingdom of God. I got to remember, he said. It took me one, one service just to get onto that level, to get into understanding then the, the way he presented the gospel so fully, because I never heard, uh, I never heard sermons on which were teaching theology or the Bible. In my little Baptist church in Hengoid in the Rami Valley, where I was saved um, 70 years ago. But I heard you know, that Jesus was the willing saviour to receive me. And one night, my heart was overwhelmed with assurance that he loved me, became my Lord and, and my saviour. So I went along to um, Memorial Hall and I heard the doctor preach and I came home and I said, Mom, I heard Dr. Martin O. Jones say, did you? She said, I, I heard him in 1930. I heard him. And you know, he said, um, listen now to this situation here in the, in the word of God. Isn't it exactly what we are facing today? And he read and it was, she said. And I said, oh, I've heard him say that too. It was a great theme with him, wasn't it? The relevance, the application, the contemporary nature, the word of God lives and abides forever. And it's relevant to everybody. Every individual who comes, however old, however young, however smart, However stupid, however rich, however poor, whatever race, the word of God is utterly re relevant to, to what they have to say. If they will have ears to hear, it is the best news that they will ever hear in their lives. And that's why we urge people to read the Bible and ask God to, to help you to, to under, understand it. So, um, you know, um, Dr. Lloyd Jones stayed there, and there were strains and pressure that he was under, demands in the middle of the week, medical demands. Uh, the doctors at first were suspicious of him and envious of him, and uh, were afraid that um, their value would be declined and the people would really go to see Lloyd Jones about medical conditions. And Ken Arnold, the um, the secretary for years of um, Sandfields, told me once how um, Lord Jones and his wife were living in them. Well, things were being done in the house and they lived with him. And so the phone call went one evening and it was for the doctor and, and he was little by listening. And it was Swansea Hospital. And there was a, 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 a the heart doctor there wanting to talk to Dr. Lloyd Jones. He had a man who'd come in and his heart was weak. And, his man, he was a surgeon, and he wanted to get the scalpel out. Now. And, and uh, he couldn't hear his end of the conversation, but he could hear Lloyd Jones speaking to him, saying, no, 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 do nothing. And tomorrow I'll come to the hospital and see him and talk to you. <laughs> and so on top of the, the stress of, um, these new converts and reforming this church and preaching in the middle of the week to churches all over Wales. Uh, there were these medical pressures. My uncle Bryn, um, he worked as a 
a shop assistant in a men's draper. And uh, he wanted to be a preacher. So he applied to Brecon and uh, Brecon examined him and said, no, he, he, he was um, not strong enough, not strong enough to be a preacher. That his heart wasn't strong enough. And he was very disappointed at that. And he talked to him and said, do you know, there's a man who's just come from London. He's gone to Sanfield and said he put all that in. He'll give you a checkup. So he, Uncle Bryn, wrote to the doctor and the doctor fixed up an appointment. And he checked him. Said to him, heart's perfectly fine. So he went back then uh, to the college and told them that he had a heart specialist telling him he was fine. And so they took him in. And I told the pilgrims about this. I asked him, did you remember? He had no recollection of Uncle Bryn going there at all. And he paused for a bit and he said, how did he do? I said, he lived till he was 84. Oh, very good, doctor said. He was very pleased that his analysis of Lloyd of Uncle Bryn was so well. But he was exhausted by 1938. It was time to change. And he was preaching in London and uh, the famous Campbell Morgan was in the congregation hearing him and he had been a preacher there in the 1920s and he'd gone to America for 10 years with his sons, his son stayed. He came back to Westminster Chapel and uh, he was getting on and he needed someone to follow him and he asked Dr. Lloyd Jones then if he would be his assistant and he preached in the morning and Dr. Lloyd Jones preached in the evening and that's how he came to Westminster Chapel. And they were joint pastors for four or five years. And it was the war years, and the, the congregation dropped and dropped. 150 were there. And at some time they had bomb damage, they had to meet in a hall somewhere. It looked very unpromising. But then um, this new emphasis on expounding the word and doing series started with second peter and then he went to other books of the bible and old testament and new testament and grew and grew on friday nights and on sunday and the, the, the church and the first gallery the second gallery was never used but it came very full and there was a West Indian church um, and uh, it heard about the need in England for workers in the National Health Service and the, the railway and so on. And most of the congregation came over and uh, Tom Tuit, they worked in the railway and they bought a, um, a railway building that was up for sale and the people from the island came and it was great blessing there. And Easton House then, who was the former pastor's son, he had a, a job in, uh, in uh, Westminster City Hall. And there were five Christians there and uh, they, they, they would say to him, um, oh, we could have been the city on Friday night, would you like to come? Oh dear, five people sitting around making suggestions, you know. Friday night, time to get home now for the weekend and enjoy home. All of them as ignorant as anyone else. And he would always say no, but they were very kind and very persuasive and he liked them. And so he said one Friday he would go. So is, is it far? No, it's not far. And his friend said, and he took him down Buckingham Gate. And they came to Westminster Chapel and they went in and <laughs> they weren't five. There were a thousand people there. And he'd never heard anything like it in his life, like many of the others when they went there. And he went to church on Sunday and he said to his pastor, you've got to come with me. You've not heard anything like this. You've got to come with me on Friday night. And he went with him and he was introduced to the Man of Truth and we met him there, Tom Tuit. And... Uh, 
he got me to preach at that black congregation. And I preached there every, every year since. The influence that Lord Jones's ministry had there. Um, well, his pattern was, of course, Sunday morning, teaching mainly to Christians. And Sunday evening, evangelistic, addressing them, uh, those that were on the borders of the promised land, on the borders of the kingdom of God, almost there, instructing them, teaching them, helping them. And then theological instruction on Friday nights. He did a series on the big major doctrines of the Bible, and then he did the series on Romans that he never that he never quite finished. And his preaching was twofold. It was discriminatory, firstly. It discriminated between those whose trust was in Jesus Christ alone and those who didn't understand that and were really thinking by going to church and by living a decent life that they would get to heaven that way, discriminating between what saving faith is. That for us to live is not morality, but for us to live is Jesus Christ. That, that our hopes are all in him. He lived the righteous life. He died the atoning death. And him we plead. And so it was a discriminatory preaching. And then it was an applicatory preaching too. That was the other characteristic of it. In other words, he was applying the word to those who heard. Were they doers of the word? Were they obeying what the word of God says here? Like the Lord Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount where he talks about the command, you shall not kill, do no violence. And then he says, but is there anger in your heart? You call people a fool. Do you lose your temper? You've broken the commandment. You're a sinner. Or the commandment, you shall not commit adultery. Do you lust in your heart? Do you let your eyes watch and your fingers on the keys? Bring down programs so that you can watch things. But there's no need. It's only lust that keeps you watching pornography. And he applied and applied the word of God. He really got under your skin. And so there was great power in, in his evangelism when he came to Wales that he brought the best messages. That is the best structured with application and illustration and evangelistic application and interesting and um, intelligent messages, messages that appealed to men's minds. And that's what he brought um, to Wales when he, when he preached in Wales, when he preached uh, in, the, in the autumn at Heath uh, every year. And the, the, the power of, of, of those meetings that... Uh, that lives on, and when he came to Arbor every two years, Welsh in the afternoon, and then um, English in, in the night, people just came. They just came from Bow Street and uh, from San Dacil, and they traveled to hear him, and he came down from the pulpit, and he'd sit there, and there'd be a line, and I'd look, I wouldn't know one of them. And he'd sit there with a smile, and they would come, and they would talk to him about some contacts they or their family had with him and he loved it all one by one they would come he was so acceptable and accessible to everyone the power of his ministry was threefold firstly he stuck to the bible to the word of god um, his phrase, I want to draw your attention to this verse. I, I showed 
that we were going to encounter the world through him. Um, and so he stuck to that. Scripture says the word of God is powerful, doesn't it? It is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It can cut you. It can cut like a scalpel your ego and yourself and it can take that from you. And it can heal you. The word of God. And ah, uh, sentiment and brotherhood and just weakened the Welsh purpose so that men never bother to go along any longer. The power of the word. And then there was the, the power also of prayer. The disciples, you remember, they said, the deacons need to look after now social troubles and the widows in the church who are, who've got no one to care for them and you do that. We will give ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the world. To prayer. Um, James concludes his great letter telling us the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much, much. So, um, don't denigrate your, your little prayers and your wandering minds um, and all. Spurgeon said, pray briefly and pray often. I think that's, uh, you know, the world in which we live, we live with God here, invisible, present. Lord, help me now. Lord, bless me. Thank you, Lord, for this. And we're talking to him. We're, we're so dependent on this living God. Um, Dr. Jones used a scheme of Robert Murray McShane that takes you through reading the Bible in a year and I would go over after he preached on a Wednesday night on a Thursday before he got the train home. I'd spend an hour or so with him and I'd, I'd find him with his Bible. He was doing his McShane portion for the day and praying there. It's the most difficult thing in the world to do. But we didn't neglect it. And then the third source of power, of course, is faith. And um, that's Hebrews 11, isn't it? How did they subdue kingdoms and work righteousness and obtain promises? How did they do it? <laughs> they were inadequate and weak men in many ways and women. Well, their, their faith, through faith, Hebrews 11 says it again and again and again, doesn't it? Keep trusting, keep believing, keep looking to God, keep speaking to him. You read books and you become an educated man. You listen to music, you become a musical man. You look to God and trust in God, you become a man of God. The power of his faith, the power of his brain, and the power of the word that he, he preached. And um, this new phenomenon, he rose. He was sui generis, that is, he was unique in his generation. That's why they had such an awful problem in finding anyone to follow him. Because there was no one quite, quite like him. And, um, you know... Some of us say, if at 1945 now, he'd uh, done 20 years of preaching, he got that. And, okay? He could have walked into a, a Labour Party seat anywhere in the world and become a member of Parliament. Could have, could have done it. Oh, they'd have given their right arms to him. So he'd have been 
an assistant by the end of the Atlee government in 1949, 1950, and then under um, the next Labour government in the in, in the fifties with Wilson, he'd have he'd have had a, a seat on the cabinet. He'd been prime minister. He said, "But I do believe that." He never, never stopped his, his trust in the power of the word of God, his faith in the promises of God, his sense of vocation, the call that he'd had from God to be a preacher of, of the word of God. And he did it in the face of the most amazing decline. Chapels, well, the, the chapels that I went to when I was a boy, Williams Memorial, Oakland Road, Barry, Tabernacle Hanger, they were all gone, they have all been knocked down. The congregations, you know, around Dowless, you know, uh, there were a thousand members in, in Bethania, in the, the year 1900. It was all gone by 1970, closed down. I know part of it is the decline of the Welsh language, that's part of it. But the spiritual decline, the way God speaks, Jesus speaks in Revelation 2 and 3 about taking the candlestick, taking the light away from churches, that don't preach the message of Jesus Christ, the message that he has bought by his precious blood and given to us to preach. And so the, the decline took place. The loss of belief in the authority of scripture. The reaction against the fake hoyle that men could put on uh, which they thought would demonstrate to the gullible in the congregation that they had the truth and they had the Holy Spirit, the Holy. Uh, the fact that they became essayists, that was it. That was the, the big preachers were those who could write lovely prose. Um, worship became the big thing. Um, oh, the Celtic church, candles and decorum and a pattern. Not the preaching. Um, entertainment came in. Testimonies went up as preaching came down. And then counselling became the great calling. Now that was the thing to instruct on a one-to-one -one basis. And it was all a lowering again of a pulpit and Jesus opened the book and found the place and the eyes of all that were in the house were set upon him. And that was it when, when Lloyd-Jones uh, Lloyd came. Well, um, they were great, great times. And there's nobody now. There's just nobody. Um, I, I belonged to the Free Church Council when I first went to Aberystwyth, and they always had the annual meeting, all the churches to support. Well, they have to say, Sopa, or Leslie, where they had to come, and people weren't interested. <laughs> they wanted Dr. Jones every year because there was no one else that moved them, that motivated them explained to them they were missing so much in life, not sitting under a gospel service week by week. What a striking personal presence he had. What a command of the language, that London Welsh accent of his, and the liveliness and the passion with which he spoke, and every line of argument that that he used, 
so logically make a point and illustrate it. You saw it, right. Your, your mind was there, then you develop it. The next point, you're, you were there now with him. He wouldn't say, I have three points, because the second point might, must, might take up so much of his time that he didn't have time for the third, that would be next week. So he would say, I want to say this to you, and then say, now the second thing I want to say to you, he didn't say that there was going to be a third, and that there all generally was. And so he opened up logically, and you knew where you were going, and you felt safe with him. Um, there was just an anointing of the Holy Spirit on his ministry. As men of sincerity, as commissioned by God in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. Yeah, that, that was the impression. The um, electric, the often awesome. Um, my wife uh, that's with us here tonight now, she, uh, she was in Westminster Chapel. And uh, the last uh, four or five years of his ministry, and uh, he finished preaching. No one hurried home to watch television. You sat and you thought about what you'd heard. People are very quiet. And it's happened sometimes with me. I've gone to the door to shake hands. No one's got out of their seat. They've been there. They've been listening. They've been convicted. They're just praying now, Lord, help me to be a better Christian. They, they are doing that. He was dedicated. He was a professional, but there was no professional artificiality. Um, he was fulfilling his calling to preach the word. There was no intellectual snobbery. Um, he was a gifted teacher. He was convinced the best thing he could do for this audience was to open up this passage of scripture and really lay it on them in its blessings and its comforts and encouragements and in its, its warning. He was a realist. He hated the shallowness of the analysis of, of what's wrong with men and women. He loved the profound analysis of the heart of man's being dead in sin and uh, in rebellion against God. And that the only thing was a new heart that was needed for men and, and women, his diagnosis. But the authority with which he spoke was the authority that comes from heaven, from the living God. And so he preached. And so we have now the Lord Jones um, library of, of his uh, sermons. We have Spurgeon um, and we have uh, the 60 volumes of his sermons. Lovely. We have that with Lord Jones, but now we have his recordings as well. But we have, we have no film, no film, not one of him preaching. And when I go to America, they often say, no, you heard the doctor, did you? Did? What was he like? How was he in the pulpit? I'd say sometimes he bounced around that pulpit in Westminster Chapel, speaking to the people in the gallery, some lively living. Nowadays, the humblest preacher, he's on film. Perhaps I'm on film tonight. And um, so we'll have some record. Sometimes I think, oh, we'll be like Abba, and they'll do some sort of clone of us uh, and, <laughs> and of the congregation, and we, we're going to see ourselves as we were the night when we were converted, listening to some. Who knows what technology can, can give? But it has to have someone whose head does not swell and whose heart is not filled with self as he preaches for us to trust. When the doctor preached, there was 
a sense of God's presence in the meeting. It was that. Everyone knew that God was there. And the seen world disappeared and this unseen world became more and more real and powerful to us. And then the other thing uh, about his, his preaching, what it did, it always produced conversions. Now, you and I, if you talk to any minister these days, they say, oh, I was helped, I had a good Sunday, the Lord was with me, the Lord was with the people. But oh, there are so few people being converted. We want to see people converted, don't we? We want to see the biggest man converted. We want to see those two women that Jeff Gobbett and his brother were preaching to and uh, they said they wanted to read the Bible. And we put a Bible for you and they gave them a Bible. The women tore it up. Tore it up. Showing their hatred. Oh, Jesus Christ and his gospel. You know, women like that. To be saved. You've got a generation of young people. I don't know what they can watch these days. It's too shameful. They're prominent in their absence from the means of grace. A whole generation under 30s. I want them to be saved. And then... um. I want us all to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's it. I'm not talking about one great explosive experience, but to have an overwhelming sense that God loves us. He loves us so much, he lives in us. And he blesses us and he keeps us and he works all things together for our good and he supplies all our needs and goodness and mercy follow us all our days and we're going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The wonderful blessings of being a mere believer in Jesus. Being filled with the spirit of Jesus Christ. Oh, men and women, how, how we need that. Um, we want to serve him. We want to give him our lives, our souls, our all. We'd say, oh, for a closer walk with God, oh, for a heavenly frame of mind, oh, we want that. There's streams on earth I tasted, more deep I shall drink and can drink here and above, Lord, help me. To drink of thee, the fountain head, be filled with the Holy Spirit. We pray that the Lord will raise up then um, in our generation and, and, and that he'll do a new thing again. That he's working in a, in a public house and he's showing me aridity and emptiness to one man and that man is determined to find out who made this world who made me how can i be saved from my sin and he do that with a shop assistant with someone who works in hoovers with a school teacher with a computer expert and he raised them up Many of them. And he'll manifest himself in, in his glory so that they want to do nothing more than serve the Lord and preach the word of God. Let's pray.
Let's pray that we'll see these things, that we'll see better days for the church of Jesus Christ. We'll see more honour and praise and glory given to our Lord Jesus than, than we are seeing at the present time. Let's pray that there be the sound of the wind in the mulberry trees, that there be the time to favour us once again. Do a new thing, Lord as you did so unexpectedly in raising up Lord Jones, raise up many like him. Amen. Lord, bless this word to us, we pray. Thank you for what you did to, to the doctor, and what you did for us through him and through, through his books and through the tapes. Thank you that we see him as a lovely family man. And thank you for the memories we have of hearing him and talking to him. And the silly things when we argued with him, we're so sorry we ever, we ever gave him any trouble at all. Thank you for him, Lord. Oh, may, may we see these days come when you make bare your arm, when you open the windows of heaven and you pour out a blessing on us. Please, Lord, may, may we live to see these days. Keep us faithful until then. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.